Uh, good morning, all. Now uh, we are very happy to have uh, our one of the best professor in the in India and famous professor in nanotechnology field, uh, Professor Sumit Kumar Ray, the former director of SN Bose National Center of Basic Sciences. We are with us. Uh, he already accepted our request and uh, find his valuable time for us uh, to give a talk on the silicon nanotexture for emerging electronic and photonic devices. I'd like to request our director, sir, Professor Sangram Mudali, to introduce Professor Ray to speak us. Sangram, sir, please. Uh, thank you, Devashish. Uh, I hope I'm audible to everybody. Uh, yes, first sir. of all, a very warm welcome to Professor Samit Kere, to National Institute of Science and Technology. Professor Ray, it's a pleasure that you are here with us and you accepted our invitation to be a part of this uh, very important uh, uh, faculty development program, which in fact, as a special case, your uh, talk today is one of the public lectures part of the NIST 25 year Silver Jubilee celebrations all across uh, our alumni, about 14,000 alumni that we have all across the world. So uh, before, uh, Introducing you, uh, let me just say a few words about NIST. NIST was established in 1996 with a group of six people who came uh, from the United States and left uh, the U.S. Uh, universities and came here to Barampur to start the National Institute of Science and Technology with the first batch of 180 students. And uh, currently we have about 3,500 students in BTEC, MTech, PhD, MBA, MCA, MSc, BSc, M and BCom programs. So it's a wide range of programs, but as our bread and butter is in technology, we have a huge research uh, setup consisting of about uh, 70 to 80 very active researchers who are mostly from the IIT and top NIT system. And uh, they have done some wonderful research. We have four Boyd's Cast fellowships, uh, three Fulbrights, and about six or seven young scientist awardees and uh, a number of uh, 30 to 40 about the postgraduate scholarships we have obtained. Last year, we had about 10 crores in uh, funding through research. And uh, this year also, we expect uh, to equal, if not surpass, the previous year's funding. And having said that, uh, our alumni are spread uh, halfway, in fact, all over the globe with half of them probably in the United States. We have currently about 14,000 alumni and uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, worked tirelessly towards building this institution uh, along with the faculty and uh, the <clears> team. <throat> and in 2016, we were declared as the 69th best institute of the country. And uh, subsequently, we are NAC accredited with a high rating of 3.22 as an A institute. And we are currently a UGC autonomous institution. Uh, because uh, of our uh, activities uh, uh, and our standing among the technical education community. Uh, very briefly, about 60 to 70 percent of our faculty are all PhDs from top schools. So uh, we uh, are very well known in AICT and uh, in uh, UGC and Department of Science and Technology, CSIR, almost every funding agency knows about us. And uh, we have uh, won uh, numerous awards because of that. Uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Samit, uh, uh, a, a versatile genius, uh, let me put it in this way, in a single uh, two words. And uh, he was just heading the Nas SN Bose National Center for Basic Sciences, uh, Kolkata, which you know bears the name of SN Bose, a giant among giants of scientists. And uh, being the director of such a prestigious institute has been uh, no mean task for Professor Ray. So he's back now at his alma mater and uh, at IIT Kharagpur. Uh, Professor Ray, uh, uh, PPP, uh, we call him Three Ps, uh, has been a good friend of ours <laughs> and uh, uh, was also the classmate of uh, Dr. Ravi Piradi, who oh, was, uh, we are all 85 batch and PPP belongs to the same batch uh, mm -hmm. of IITs. Mm -hmm. And uh, Professor Bose is back in the Department of Physics at IIT Kharagpur. And uh, he, obviously, he had uh, numerous chances of heading the department. And he is the founder head of the School of Nanoscience and Technology at IIT Kharagpur. 
his research interest are in the area of uh, semiconductor nanostructures quantum dots photovoltaics and nanophotonic devices in fact uh, you know after going through a number of international conferences in the last few years on uh, nanotechnology uh, nist has significantly spent uh, its money where its mouth is in uh, developing uh, nano uh, technology laboratories and uh, today uh, we have a lot of devices uh, uh, for coating sputtering testing and uh, you know uh, layout design mm-hmm. back end device uh, software and uh, emi emc uh, testing devices and things like that and uh, we are very active in the organic uh, photovoltaic materials as well and uh, therefore we have very significant tie ups with uh, taiwan with japan and some of those uh, universities which are uh, much more leaders in the area of nanotechnology obviously this is one area which requires huge amount of funding and uh, with its limited funding nist has been able to do substantial work and it is to the credit of our uh, coordinator uh, dr debashish panda that each year he sends at least 3 to 4 students to taiwan uh, for uh, uh, you know definitely getting as ms or a phd program mm-hmm. for japan so our students are well spread out and uh, debashish has been a key leader in the area of uh, nanotechnology Professor Ray is a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences India and the Indian Academy of Engineering, uh, West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology, and is the recipient of INSA Young Scientist Award, uh, UGC Homi Bhabha Award, a very prestigious award, the MR 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 SI Superconductivity and Material Science Senior Award, etc. Um, you know, uh, I remember very well. Uh, you know, uh, trying to find out what is MR MR SI. I, I really don't know. Professor Rai will probably tell me about that. But I distinctly remember I should not enter those areas which I don't know. Because once I invited a minister to inaugurate my VLSI Center of Excellence at Bhuvneshwar, and the way he pronounced VLSI mm-hmm. Center, you know, that itself uh, had the audience splits because he didn't know VLSI is one word right. and it mm-hmm. said in one breath. so i'm sure uh, dr ray will do justice to the things that i have, uh, i don't know exactly he has published more than 325 research papers in the top peer reviewed journals i yesterday i was glancing through his peer reviewed journals and uh, there's a wide variety of uh, works and i'm sure he must have had about 20 plus phd students working under him who have got through phd's he has seven book chapters and co-authored a book on uh, strain silicon heterostructures materials and devices published by the ie uk so having said that and uh, having seen uh, professor ray back at uh, iit kharagpur gives me a great joy that he has agreed to be a uh, to be with us on a public lecture uh, uh, number 3 in the series of lecture which was in fact started by your iit kharagpur alumni Professor Farooq Mistry oh, from I the see. University yes. of Oklahoma. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. Farooq gave the first talk on mm-hmm. uh, uh, Atman Nirbhar Bharat, mm-hmm. and uh, you know after that we had a second talk uh, from the professor of IIT Delhi at the National Education Policy uh, on June second, and today yours is the third public lecture. Mm-hmm. So, with a request to Professor Rai to uh, ensure that uh, some of us are not as bright as he. even the not even a quarter of the brightness that he <laughs> glows with uh, we would love uh, if he starts with a little basics and brings up to date and uh, what is uh, the so great thing that nanotechnology is all about and uh, we look forward to your talk and thank you once again professor uh, you know had the corona be not there you would have been in our midst in yeah. a room full full of auditorium full uh, structure but uh, okay. today we have uh, uh, you know uh, working across online and uh, i hope that uh, uh, you will definitely accept our invitation to visit us when the time permits after the corona is over and please be our guest and uh, you know hopefully we will have probably ask you to uh, give us some ideas of working with our uh, in collaboration with our research staff headed by debashish panda dr ajit panda and so many we have a number of join of uh, faculty members uh, in the semiconductor area and uh, so wishing you again a warm welcome thank you so much and uh, let's listen to professor rai as he begins his talk yeah uh, 
Okay, thank you, Professor Mudali, for a very nice introduction about the NIST and, of course, some introduction about me. So I'm really grateful to you, for, particularly for treating this lecture as a public lecture. So this is a pleasure for me. And Devashish Panda, being my ex-PhD student, it is always my pleasure that I cannot, never actually, I have to always accept his invitation. So it's really my pleasure to speak in this, uh, uh, particularly in, in this short-term course as well as the lecture. In fact, I visited NIST, I don't remember the exact year, maybe in 2000, 2001. I know it is at the very beginning. In fact, there are a few professors, uh, somebody called Professor Partho Chakraborty or somebody actually invited us for a kind of a, uh, kind of a, kind of a course. So I remember visiting that campus was coming up. So it was an extremely nice campus at the bank of the, of course, Bharampur was very, very, the Shri Beach was, the Gopalpur and Shri was very, very nearby. So it is a very cordial kind of a uh, invitations. So in future, definitely will be very, I'll be very happy to uh, join again, come back to the NIST and do some kind of collaborative work. So it's good that I'm back at IIT Kharagpur. So now I have got more time for research than the administration. So obviously, I have got more time to do that. And of course, just to, uh, I don't want to go to the details that MRSI is basically the Materials Research Society of India. Uh, that is the kind of a one society they talk about different kind of materials, including semiconductor, nanotechnology. So anyway, so I am part of that and probably got some hours. So nothing big of, about that. Okay, so uh, this is the lecture for the today. So as Professor uh, Mudal said, yeah, I know the audience is a mixed audience. So I don't want to go to the research immediately. I definitely want to give some introduction. And I have seen some of the lecture plan that has been done in the course. It's very, very nice. So I'll try to bridge some of the gaps and maybe there'll be some overlap with many of them. Uh, so that is good for the participants to gather some knowledge uh, from this lecture. So with this, so let me move to the, my first slide. So this you can see is more or less the motivation of the, the lecture of so-called nanoelectronics. So there is the title of this uh, workshop, the silicon nanoelectronics. Why should we go to nanoelectronics at all, what is the problem with a normal bulk silicon MOSFET? And all of you know in the audience that this is the actually the, the so-called the transistor, the tiny transistor that we have everywhere in our computer mobile phone, which is called actually a CMOS transistor. So as you know, there is a the blue color, uh, the green color source, the uh, again green color drain, and you create a actually inversion layer in the channel of this MOSFET and which is gate coupled. So this is called MOSFET. The oxide is the uh, MOS, oxide is the, actually the gate and the, the metal and there's a substrate. So uh, this is the, now the question is that how this goes, how this device actually has been scaled down over the last 50 years. So I'll start about that. So remember we call this one, the, the distance between the two green, green zone is called the channel length. And the thickness you can see the gray layer thickness is the oxide thickness. Because maybe in, uh, in the next slide, I'll be using this uh, terminology. So firstly, that why do we need to scale the transistor? Why do we need to come from micron scale to the nano scale? Yeah, this, uh, of course, you know this already. Probably you already know that it gives a high speed and we need high speed for internet downloading, software, uh, computation, etc. On the same time, we know we, uh, nowadays we are using all portable devices like mobile, iPad, laptop. So it must take very, very low power, okay? And the third thing is that, of course, the density of the transistor, the density of the, this thing should be high so that we can have more and more functionality and have a very low cost. So these are the demand of the, you can say, the demand of the users. And now the scientists have to work, how can you meet most of the demand using the current technology? Okay, so... Uh, so, yeah, so let's, uh, Devashish, is some of the portion the top is cutting off or is it okay? Okay, maybe my, maybe the title or the heading of the slide is getting cutting off, but... Uh, it's okay, whatever you... Oh, this slide, but I, I'll explain. So here okay. in this slide, I'm trying to see that for the CMOS digital logic circuit, as I said, that is used in all memory, computations and switch. So it has to be low power, high density, and very, very fast speed. And as you see, this is from a actual textbook equation. If we plot the delay, the gate delay, that's the switching delay as a function of the gate length. And you see that 
when you started from something like from five microns to sub micron region, as you see that as the gate length decreases, the gate delay also decreases. So that is this is the picosecond scale. It depends upon your computer to work in the gigahertz to 10 gigahertz, 20 gigahertz range. So we have to reduce the gate delay. So that's why you have to reduce the gate length. And this is given by the one simple equation. Just I am using a part of the equation. Gate delay is inversely proportional to the ID, which is called the drain current of a MOSFET. And ID is actually defined by these three terms, okay, you are proportional to these term, three terms. As you know, mu is the mobility of the carriers, which is fixed. The electron and hole mobility and silicon is fixed. T ox is the oxide thickness that I have shown in the gray color. And L, L is the gate length. So as you see that if you reduce L and reduce the T ox, the Ig goes up. And Ig goes up as Ig goes so, Yes, Ig goes up, the gate delay decreases. So that is the whole motivation for the whole thing. Now, how can you implement that or how can you achieve that? Okay, one more thing is very, very important before I uh, go to this thing that, of course, if you make a, uh, a lower gate length, your delay will be less. We have to take, um, to take care of what is the effect of the device scaling on power. That you also have to understand. So here I'm using P stands for power. Power standby means, as you know, that we have got billions of transistors in an integrated circuit chip. But not all of them are switched on at one time. Maybe only 10% of them are switched on in a particular logic or memory work. And 90% of them are off at any particular time. But in the off state also, they take some power because there is always a leakage current to the, to the transistor. So this is what we call the standby power. This is not the active power. Standby power depends upon what is the leakage current and what is the actually drain voltage that you have used for the biasing. Okay, so, and what is the active power? So next, if I go, I'm sorry, maybe I've gone too fast here. Uh, okay, this is the active power. The active power is given by the capacitance, what is the parasitic capacitance of the devices and the so-called the gate bias divided by the uh, so-called the, in fact, I use the TD here, the actually gate direct thickness and the VDD. So actually, if you see, I have used earlier the delay equations, and now I will use the power equations. So power delay is given by the capacitance into the VDD square. So if you now see that ultimately you need a mobile phone, so that the mobile phone should be actually, once you charge your battery, you want that it should go for one day, two days, probably three days. So the lower the gate voltage, lower the actually the power delay product. And that's what actually, the scaling means hard, that if you reduce the oxide thickness, the power delay product reduces. If you reduce your VDD, this power delay thickness reduces. If you uh, reduce the overall thickness, overall capacitance, the parasitic capacitance of the circuit, the actually power delay product reduces. And that is the only one thing if you scale your devices, it increases density, it increases speed, and reduces the power. Yes. So, this is again little bit in textbook. I think many of you probably have read in a so-called that uh, very uh, VLSIC circuits that what happens here I have shown K is the actual scaling factor. That means if you, uh, if you reduce the uh, dimension, the length, channel length of the MOSFET or the thickness of the MOSFET by factor of K, one by K, and you see there is a tremendous effect on the devices. Firstly, the vertical dimensions, the oxide thickness, and the junction depth also actually has to be reduced by one by K. That means this is basically actually the rule. This is called the design rule, various design rule. If you do that, the area also of the devices goes by one by K square. And if you if the area of the one by trans, one transistor goes by one by K square, then only you have got more and more density. That's why see device density goes as K square. Okay. Now the doping density has to be increased by K for the device to work nicely. And at the same time, the bias voltage and current, the VDD goes by one by K. So overall, the power dissipations goes by one by K square. So that's what you see, what is the advantage? If you reduce the L by, by one by factor of one by K, your actually device density increases by K square, your power dissipation actually decreases by one by K square. And that's what you want, isn't it? But of course, the density remains same, power distribution density remains same, it does not change because the power distribution has come down, but the area has also come down. 
Similarly, I don't want to go to all of them. Actually, as you see here, the as I said, the current density goes by uh, goes by a factor of k, and that's why the delay time goes by one by k. And what is the most important, the transistor power delay product, which I used in the first slide, actually goes as a one by k q. So if you reduce by this thing by ten times l by ten times, your transistor the power delay product improves by thousand times. So that is a huge improvement. And that's the whole motivation for the scaling of the senior circuit, and that's why you want to go from micron scale to sub micron scale to the nano scale, which is nothing but the nano electronics. And that's how actually it has actually happened for the last 50 years. We can see that it started around 70s or so, and right now we are in 21. So how the gate length has reduced from 5 micron to, in fact, this is a little bit of old slides. So as you see that we have shown. What will happen after to 2020? So it's kind of uncertainty. This is actually, uh, is, as you know, is a, is, a, is a famous Moore's law. Moore predicted that how things will go up, how the chip functionality increase every 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 four times, every 3.4 years, and all these things goes up. So as you know, today we are actually commercially available. Uh, actually, CMOS circuit available in your computer and mobile phone with a technology of nine nanometer into 2021. But now, with the recent actually announcement of the IBM and TSMC, many of you who actually read the newspaper, you know there is no uncertainty. There is a clear actually path. Actually, there is a clear actually pathway that what will be happen probably at least for the next five years. So really, if you see that from 2005 word five word. This silicon CMOS has come to become a nano electronics uh, nano nano CMOS because the gate length is below initially 90 nanometer about probably 15 years back and about 9 nanometer today. And what will happen next? Now the main problem, though I have shown you the power delay product improves, this is a big problem when you basically what you do when you scale down the devices to the nanometer scale. So as you say that only 10% of the devices are switched on or take the active power. 90% of the devices are in a, a basically switched off or they are backed by standby power. But below 65 nanometer or so, that almost the equivalent power is almost like a, that all the devices are on. So that actually increases the power density of the devices, and that's the whole reason your laptop goes becomes so hot, your mobile becomes so hot. When you use for 10-15 minutes, and that's why you have to use a very very good heat sink. Otherwise, your device will fail. Now I have done a simple calculation. Since this is a kind of a, a kind of a course, so a little bit of pedagogy. That if you think of that uh, today, you try to put some limit. But uh, after this calculation, what I will say, this calculation I have done few years back. But probably today now I understand that my calculation must be something wrong. So my calculation is not wrong. Probably the technology will be some some innovations will be there so that we get a new technology to prove the calculation wrong. Okay, so in few years back when I was talking about actually that a typical chip contains about uh, five billion transistors per chip and the gate length of the MOS was about forty nanometer. The MOS was forty nanometer and I already told you that we are already in the kind of nine nanometer node in twenty or twenty twenty two. You see now, and the number of transistor per chip is approximately 20 billion transistor. Don't take the exact value, and each of them taking a energy of about 130 auto joule. Auto means 10 to the minus 18, and they work typically at a they will work typically at a clock speed of 10 gigahertz, and that is the speed of the computer probably in the next few hours, five few years. So let us see how much power it takes. So it's basically energy into the count of the number of uh, transistors. They are about two billion, sorry, twenty billion. This is a clock speed, and I have assumed that only ten percent of the devices are actually switched on. Though I have told you that even if the device is switch, not switched on because of the leakage current, there's a lot of power there. And if you calculate this power, this power is about very very huge, about two sixty kilowatt. So please try to think of a 260 kilowatt of power is being dissipated in a chip size of few centimeter square, and you try to calculate what is the power density. The question is that if it goes up and up, 
if you really cannot uh, cool your device, this will be ultimately the limit of the scaling. Now, just I want to tell you that some of you must have seen that uh, probably a month back or a few weeks back that IBM has actually announced that they are going for two nanometer technology. So my calculation is about nine nanometer technology. So if you can think of the two nanometer, how this power goes up, it will go almost to the megawatt level, isn't it? And TSMC, that's the biggest foundry in Taiwan, has put a competition about one nanometer jet level. I don't know how they will do this power management, but definitely they have something in mind. And I can tell you that all these mobile phones like Apple, et cetera, are very, very, uh, very, very uh, so smart computer companies have already booked this chip for two nanometer, one nanometer chips from IBM and TSMC is almost pre-booked. So probably it will be launched in two, three years time in the commercial market. So you'll see that things are changing every day because of the scaling. Okay, that is the one till now what I've thought actually shown you is a basically bulk CMOS, the, 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 the schematic that I've shown you earlier, that is actually the bulk CMOS. When actually you go to the nanometer scale, the actually CMOS device is not like that. CMOS device is completely different. So do we call them the non-classical MOSFET structure? So the actually the idea is the same that you should have a very high, high drain current IG and the drain current depends upon inversely proportional to the gate length. And if you can increase the width of the gate, actually drain current also increases. So that's why the people have come with a new design, actually. I don't want to go into details of that, but I don't. I wanted you to know the names at least, some of you probably know. These are technology that are currently available in the commercial market is no longer in that kind of uh, fate. It's called fin fate. Fin is actually, actually the fin of the fish. And you know that the fin of the fish, so as you see, the gate is something like that. So you've got a very, very large gate area here. And this is the source and drain. So they actually show that your width is increasing, the length has reduced, so the current is more. Similarly, something called double gate fit. I mean, instead of one gate, you have source and drain. You have gate one and gate two. And the channel is actually made of something like a not silicon, it's called silicon and insulator. It's a completely new technology. Otherwise, you cannot go to that. Uh, anything below probably 10 nanometer, you cannot go with a conventional bulk CMOS device. So this is the state of the art devices, fin fate, double gate fate, all around fate, all around gate fate, all these things are coming. And uh, these are some of the old, actually, uh, the pictures, schematic pictures that I've got from the, probably from some of the slides or the internet. Sorry, I could not, I forgot to write for the source of this material because I don't remember. But as you see that uh, this is a so-called the nano electronic MOSFET, the gate length is about 10 nanometer or so. Yeah, LG, the gate length is about 10 nanometer. As I told you that we are doing nine nanometer. So this is the, so, so this is a single gate but you have got actually thin fat looks like that. The gate actually goes like that and you have got so many source and then. So silicon nanowires actually works like a thin of the gate. Otherwise, the people go for other technologies also. Instead of silicon, uh, people go for three, five semiconductors also uh, called hemp technologies, called the multi-layered epitaxial three, five semiconductors, then carbon nanotube fat, silicon nanowire fat. These are still not coming to the actual the market but uh, we believe that some of the uh, fates that will be used in one nanometer and two nanometer technology in the future, probably many of them use the silicon nanowire as a channel instead of bulk CMOS. So it's a completely new technology. So you are in the range of the silicon nanoelectronics and probably there's no end of it. Now, I will just, uh, yeah, this is just kind of a background. And now with this, I'll just try to give a background. Why do we go to the, uh, okay, this is one kind of a justification that one we, why you should go from micro to nano in terms of the switching speed, power, the integration area, okay, device, uh, device density. The other is that whether you can increase the performance of the device, okay, by, you know, at, at the same actually get length, whether we can increase the performance of the devices. So whether you can think of some alternative nanomaterials or alternative technology, so that is also part of the nanotechnology or quantum technology, which I will discuss that. And uh, this kind of technology have got more, uh, actually, I will show as I will show you in the part of the talk, this kind of technology is very, very important for silicon photonics. Because till now, what we are doing all silicon nanoelectronics, 
but there is a big thing also coming on parallelly silicon photonics why i will explain to you in few minutes and all these devices actually uh, use some kind of a new concept called heterojunctions and the concept of heterojunction was given by shockley and comer in 1958 okay so heterojunction means what is the see, till now all the silicon cmos is done by the silicon one kind of uh, material so no two different materials but in this case heterojunction junctions are made with two different semiconductor with different band gap at different lattice constant lattice constants you know in a crystal the difference between the two lattice points now depending upon the choice of material there can be different kind of actually heterojunction band alignment because as i say there are two different band gaps one is narrow band gap in this case is semiconductor 2 and one is actually probably wide band gap in this case is semiconductor 1 so there can be type 1 band offset when this narrow band gap comes in between the high band gap material so the alignment can be either like this or alignment can be little bit different as you see that it does not come in between but there is a kind of staggering that this is the conduction band and this is the valence band and there is a scattered staggering of these things so this is called type 2 and there is something like that when the valence band of one material actually uh, crosses the conduction band of the other material so these are actually very very important this first one is very good for making a quantum lasers first second two is also to make super lattices and quantum cascade lasers this is a part of the photonic devices and type 3 of this thing is very very useful for making a actually tunnel fades or actually that resonant tunneling diodes so which are also actually the workhorse for making a uh, probably in the future in the quantum electronics and quantum photonics or for quantum computing this kind of devices may be used in the future so this is very very futuristic and this you can get only from the so called heterostructures not from a homojunction uh i probably will just avoid this slide because this is too much on materials but just i want to tell you one thing as i said when there is a change of band gap there is a change of lattice constant also as i said and uh, while choosing two different band gap material you must have to see that they are that to the lattice constant also matches like for example this is the silicon that is constant is the silicon band gap and as you know the germanium band gap is lower so germanium lattice constant is higher than silicon but unfortunately uh, just like a building when i building making a multi storage building i just cannot make the first floor the area much higher than the first ground floor or 10th floor much higher than the uh, ground floor then the whole building will collapse the same thing i cannot build a germanium thin film on silicon because they have got a strong lattice mismatch otherwise as you know the germanium the mobility is are much faster compared to silicon electron and whole mobility is we probably could have got much faster time distance on the other hand as you see the germanium has got a very good lattice match match with a gallium arsenide since this is a semiconductor course we also know that gallium arsenide is a direct band gap semiconductor and that's why very very actually attractive for laser photovoltaic devices etc all optical devices on the other hand silicon is a actually indirect band semiconductor so it's not good for actually lasers of course it is used for photovoltaics but you use a higher thickness of silicon so actually there is no technology available right now right now whether you can grow gallium or silicon silicon if you can do that then there will be one more big through then actually that we can make electronic devices on silicon and photonic devices on gallium arsenide and make a gallium arsenide on silicon so people are trying for the last 2 3 decades there is very very good progress but till now actually uh, there is no breakthrough but people are still trying so this is the heterostructures i just talking and probably i'll just uh, okay i'll just probably uh, skip this slide for, for the right time right now because of the lack of time now uh, the question is that what do we gain if we really gain something do we gain something if we make heterostructures and you to make a kind of a quantum structures i'll define what is quantum structure now every heterostructure is not quantum structure so all leds that you get in the market if you make a if you take a led pointer or you are using a kind of any led in your supermarket or even the leds that you see the white leds for the display devices 
these are actually these LEDs are made up either of crystal structures or the actually quantum wave or quantum dot. Now, what is the quantum things coming? We know that electrons actually is the main carrier device. We know by the principle of quantum mechanics or the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that electrons can behave as either as a particle or a wave. Whether it behaves as a particle or wave will depend upon the actually dimension of your device. So normal silicon CMOS devices, it works as a particle. It, uh, probably it is more than 10 nanometer or so. But we will see that if the device really goes to 2 nanometer, 1 nanometer, all the electrons will behave as a wave. So basically, one of the criteria sometimes we define that when the electron wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength, as you know, the de Broglie wavelength is the uh, wavelength that the de Broglie defined, de Broglie hypothesis. When the de Broglie wavelength of the carrier is comparable to the feature size or the gate length, we can call it a quantum device. If it is more, we can call it, we call it a classical device. Uh, yeah, this is a very famous, nice story. I also always used to tell that electron was discovered by J.J. Thompson in 1897, and he got the Nobel Prize in 1906 for the discovery of electron when people started making a lot of uh, valves and other things using the electron. But his son, G.P. Thompson, actually in 1937, he got the Nobel Prize. He, by the experiment, he showed that electron is not always a, always a particle, electron is a wave. So the first, actually, that experiment that was done to scoop electron was a wave by two scientists, John Thompson was one of them. So this is a very nice story of the father and the son. One says electron is a wave, particle, another says, one actually discovers electron, another says it's a wave. So now let us try to calculate the de Broglie wavelength. I mean, I don't want to, I always like to give a practical example. Let us try to give de Broglie wavelength of carriers in a semiconductor structure. And as you know that de Broglie wavelength is given by H, which is the Planck's constant, by root over 2 m star E, where m star is the effective mass of the carrier, of the electrons and holes. Sometimes for optical case, instead of de Broglie wavelength, we use one more term as the exciton board radius. But forget about that, it's more or less the same dimension. Now, let me take some values. Suppose we take m star, the effective mass of the electron is about 0.1 of m0, and m0 is the free electron mass. And we take the device at room temperature t equal to 300k because this energy is half m squared. So, if you make the temperature more, that actually your energy goes up. And this lambda is calculated, de Broglie wavelength is calculated about 5 nanometers. Okay, approximately. Now take gallium arsenide is one semiconductor where the effective mass of the electron is about 0 0.07 m0. So if it is a 0 0.07 m0, m star is a denominator. So obviously, if you see that this will go up to probably 8 to 9, 9 nanometer. So that means we make a gallium arsenide device with 80 nanometer is a quantum device for gallium arsenide. For silicon, this effective mass is almost double of this. So you can approximately say is a root over square of something like that. So it will come to 3.5 to 4 nanometer. So if you have the silicon, so till now I will say, that's what I'm saying, that when you're considering a 9 nanometer device, this really we don't have to consider the electron uh, as a wave. But in some cases, some quantum effect is there. But if we really go to 2 nanometer, 1 nanometer technology, actually, then definitely the size of this uh, uh, channel will be less than the 3, 4 nanometer of the wavelength, and then it will be completely quantum devices. So your all equations for modeling, everything will change. So yeah, this is the conclusions. So higher the effective mass, higher is the lambda or the debug wavelength, and higher is the lambda, it is easier to make the nanofabrication. And of course, this is depending on the temperature, and this effect will be predominant at lower and lower temperature. Okay, this is some of the history of these uh, so-called, how did it started, what, when is, who started the heterostructures and the quantum structure. I mean, these scientists, three scientists are given the Nobel Prize. This Herbert Cromer, as I, uh, as I told you that he got a uh, kind of a, uh, that Nobel Prize for, uh, sorry, uh, he didn't get the Nobel Prize. I'm sorry, I'm very, very uh, sorry to say, Cromer gave the concept, but since he already got Nobel Prize for a silicon uh, transistor, he didn't get the Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prize was given by uh, given to 2000 to this actually that Kilby and the Alpha Rob actually. Okay, so this uh, 
I'm sorry again, the Kumar was given the Nobel Prize. Sorry, Sokle was not given the Nobel Prize. Please pardon me. So Kumar was given the Nobel Prize. Kilby was from Texas Institute given the Nobel Prize for integrated circuit technology. And Al Farab, actually, Russian scientist, was given for the Nobel Prize for the uh, quantum laser. And uh, before that, actually, the first, I, I, I think the first uh, nano device that was made in the laboratory is nothing but a tunnel diode. Because they, as you know, that tunneling takes place in the Jinnard diode. So Jinnard diode actually was actually tunneling phenomena in the semiconductor structure was first explained by Leo Isaki. And this is sometimes called Isaki tunnel diode. And in fact, he said, if you take a PN junction, there's a quantum tunneling takes place. And he experimentally proved that during his PhD thesis, though initially it was not accepted by the reviewer because the reviewer thought it's a too speculative a phenomena. But finally, he proved it and he got the Nobel Prize. And there are very few people got the Nobel Prize in their PhD thesis work, and Isaki was one of them. Okay, now let us see what happens uh, to actually that uh, for heterostructures when the width of this actually is reduced, uh, the width of this well is reduced to below, below the de Vogt wavelength. So uh, let me explain this figure, that will be very clear. I make a heterostructure with a material semiconductor A, which is high band gap. And narrow band gap material is the material B. And another material, the same material actually, is flanking the heterostructure, the wide band gap material. So you think of yourself like a your bucket of water, isn't it? You have a bucket with a two so-called high barrier, and you have got water inside. So it's something like that. So this is the this is the one bucket as a one well we get in the conduction band and one will be the value band. So think is the water in the bucket. But as the quantum theory tells us, the quantum physics tells us, if you put some electrons in these wells, this fine, if the width of the well is more than the de Broglie wavelength, it behaves as a, like a classical particle. But as soon as this width of the well is below the de Broglie wavelength, so we have used, a, all of you have done some kind of a, uh, this thing that particle trapped in a well, so for the infinite order, energy is given by n square h square by 8 m star l square. For n is the quantum number, h is the Planck's constant, m star is the effective mass, and l is the, the width of the well. So now what happens, as you see, that to make the width of this well below the de Broglie wavelength, firstly, this, the first phenomena that you get is that your energy will be quantized. That is the quantum physics. It will not be a... Uh, distribution of energies, this will be the ground state and this will be the first excited state in the conduction band and similarly in the valence band. And as you know, in the valence band, there's a heavy hole, light hole. So that's why I use the term LH1, LH2. And the electron is now actually described by wave function because since this wave, so this wave function, and as you know, that electron actually has got a probability of tunneling through the barrier. So there is a phenomenon called tunneling. So all nice things happen actually. So as you see that the first thing that it happens is basically you can tune the band gap of the material by just simply changing the width of the well. If you take a, suppose this is a narrow band gap material that I have taken material B, as you know the band gap in the semiconductor is defined by the top of the valence band and the bottom of the conduction band. So this is the E, isn't it? But as soon as it becomes a quantum well, as you see, that electrons cannot come to this state because this is the ground state. So the band gap will be now given by from this level to this level. So basically you have increased the actually band gap of this material. This is actually called the effect is called quantum size effect. Or then, and that is the whole thing of uh, uh, basically that doing the nanotechnology for optical devices to have the quantum size effect or quantum blue shift. So the effective band gap becomes the bulk material, bulk band gap, e.g plus EC1, this is the EC1, and this is the E heavy hole one. So the band gap increases. And as you see that if we just go on changing the L, the band gap is a completely tunable. So now actually in the quantum well structure, this we are calling quantum well, you have semiconductor band gap is fixed, but just simply by varying the width of the well, you can change the band gap of the material. So this is called a, say, something called band gap engineering. And this is very much used for making that for optical communications. We make the lasers, as you know, we, the optical communication is the light propagating through an optical fiber. 
and as you know the optical fiber that only for few wavelengths this has got a very very low absorption and the light can propagate up hundreds of kilometers okay so but unfortunately that that particular wavelength is not or that particular energy is not available in the natural semiconductor so people make the quantum well and try to change the cell so that we can make a laser of wavelength where the fiber optics has got a very very low absorption so this is used for our all optical communication all internet that we are doing this is based on this quantum well technology how we have got a quantum well for a optical sources okay so this is uh, just uh, the most basic and uh, depending of the structure probably you have heard through this uh, short term course or even beforehand the depending upon the that uh, dimensions actually that confinement of the dimensions as you know the bulk is basically x y z so if the dimension is more than some de broglie wavelength in both x y z directions it is more is called a bulk so let me take as a 10 nanometer is a kind of that uh, scale so sometimes uh, okay so as a de broglie wavelength so in the uh, previous case i have taken a quantum well which is a, which is called two dimensional structure because its electron energy is confined only in the z directions because thickness of the z direction is below 10 nanometer but since the x and y is very very long so it's not quantized there so that's why we can stop three dimension now we now call two dimension and now if we make a just a just pit a piece of rod from this uh, the two dimension material by some kind of a nano lithography technique which actually called something like a quantum wire or nano wire i'm sure that uh, dr kostab dar first kostab dar was showing lot of electromagnetic lithography how to make a quantum structures so this is the example from two dimension you take one of these things you get some kind of a something called the one dimension sometimes they are called actually quasi it's not a perfectly that's why i use the term quasi so these are called quantum wires nano wires etc and if you can again cut so in this direction if you can take a cut a small box is a called a three dimensional confinement and three dimensional confinement gives like a zero dimensional structure and what are actually called quantum dots now all of them has got some kind of applications in actually in different kind of structures like if you make a quantum wire and nano wire so the transistors that i was talking about earlier a silicon channel the silicon channel will be complete like one dimensional channel or a nano wire channel so future 1 nanometer 2 nanometer set that you are thinking of by tsmc ivm they may consider a silicon channel so actually so it will be very very easy to fabricate it will be very very so maybe silicon nano wire set even on the other hand that will see that all the lasers or detectors photon detectors lasers and many other things that can be made that can be made of something like a quantum dot so that's what actually this dimensionality these are overall we can call low dimensional structure these structures actually will be in the future probably change the i mean the vision of the device as that what think of now i will give few applications actually i will take few applications uh, and i will just explain few applications so in the first case i am taking an application of again that probably the top portion is card the heading of the slide is the actually is called quantum dot memory or a nano crystal memory this can be used for a uh, I, i you know that you use you always use a flash drive okay or pen drive to have uh, to store lot of uh, bits in our actual memory stick since the memory size uh, the, the the that's and the capacity goes on every the increasing every day now it easily you can have a 32 gb 64 gb actually pen drive if you think of solid state drive solid state drive is coming very very fast is a huge amount of memory huge amount of memory uh, storage now what is the principle the principle is nothing but actually it is a principle is called something called floating gate actually what happened actually i am just uh, showing you an example and this first uh, uh, and i am showing is a silicon nano crystals or quantum dot uh, nano crystals or quantum dot basically almost the same terminology was first introduced by in 1996 in ibm uh, he was an indian sandeep tiwari i mean he, he first introduced and now actually is commercially available so what is happening in this case let us see this is a normal uh, suppose a transistor with a source then substrate channel okay and then you have actually there are two kinds of gate actually in fact i have not shown actually two kinds of gate one as i have said that you can see that that uh, uh, this this circles the circles acts as actually gate 
which is called floating gate. Why I am calling floating gate? Because this is not connected to the outside world. And there is one more gate, maybe typically polysilicon gate actually. So there is one more gate, polysilicon gate here. And in between these gate, two gates, there is a small, I mean, a, a bit thin oxide, which I'll show you probably in the next slide. Thin oxide, and in between this gate and the channel, you have got thin oxide. Okay, now what happens in this case? So I've drawn actually that I have shown just now you create a quantum well. As I said, that this is called control gate. So this is a control gate. Think of a metal. Then you have got oxide. So oxide is a silicon dioxide whose band gap is very, very high. So I have shown as energy barrier. Then you have got that actually uh, nanocrystals is a narrow band gap material like silicon. So that's why I have shown as a quantum well. Then again, we have got an oxide. That's why I have shown a barrier. And then the substrate is made of silicon, then uh, like this. Now what happens if we apply actually a gate voltage in the control gate? Suppose you think, you think of something that this color you see that I have shown a blue color and actually white color. White color means there is no charge in this nanocrystal. And the blue color means that I have injected some electrons in the nanocrystal. Okay. Either in, yeah, or it can be opposite. It does not mean it's like that. So what is most important, when I apply some gate voltage here, suppose, uh, suppose I put a gate voltage, so negative gate voltage will happen, that electrons actually will be tunneled through this oxide and actually electrons will be uh, stored here. And when I remove the gate, these electrons will not able to go away. So this is kind of a kind of a writing actually, you are putting some charges in your transistor because you know memory is nothing but one and zero state. So when you put actually some charge, so normally if it is say one state and when you put some charges, it will look like this is like a zero state. So what will happen? How do I know that it works as a memory? How do I read it? How, how do I erase it? It's something like that. If you put a IDVD curve or IDVD curve, the drain current of a MOSFET and the gate voltage of a MOSFET. So when there's no charges, your characteristic was something like this, this red, red one. And when you have put some charges, when you want to switch on these devices, when you read these devices, the threshold voltage of this transistor will go up because there are already some electrons are here as negative features. So you have to put more voltages to switch on the devices. So as you see, this has will go up. There is something kind of hysteresis. Any kind of hysteresis actually shows as a memory. So if you see here, so when the, uh, the device was in this state, this was the threshold voltage, something like that. When the device is in this state, when the threshold voltage increases by writing. And if you have use a voltage, suppose this is one volt and this is five volt, if you use a voltage of three volt, so if the device is off state, actually, as you see, that if it's three volt, there will be a lot of current. And if the device is programmed, actually, there will be no current. So it will be able to read whether the, uh, that actually the memory is switched on, I mean, programmed or not. And that is actually this nanocrystal memory. The question is that why do we use the nanocrystal? The main reason is that a few years back, most of the conventional memories in the industry was something like that. Instead of nanocrystals, actually the, the, a, the, the polysilicon was used actually, actually was the first polysilicon was as a floating plate and second polysilicon was used the kind of a control gate and there are some oxides in between but the thickness of the oxides has to be very, very thin. And so there is a lot of leakage. And because of the leakage, there is a problem that is very, very difficult to store the charges for a long time. But when you put, because this is a continuous, net, if there is one leakage, some charges will leak through to the channel and you lose the memory. But if you put isolated nanocrystal, the advantage is that they are firstly, they are isolated. So even if there is a leakage in one nanocrystal, only the charge will leak from that nanocrystal but there will be no leakage from these nanocrystals. And since the vertical thickness has going down very, very, vertical thickness is much smaller now in this case. So the voltage that you need to operate this memory will be very, very small. So that's the power is small. So this is one example of uh, the so-called the quantum dot or nanostructure memory. And, but this is already CMOS compatible and that's why it's already available in the market in a flash, uh, I mean, yeah, flash memory devices. So I will just uh, uh, skip this one. Actually, what I said, instead of one, one says of nanocrystal, this is some of the research work done by 
uh, in fact, Panda also did some work on that, but afterward, Rajshekar also did, but it took a dialectic and instead of one side, one layer of nanocrystal, he put four or five layers of nanocrystals and can see the characteristics of the memory, actually the history is a window. As you I have shown you the history is a window, we also get history is a window in capacitance, voltage characteristics, and higher is the history is a window, the better is the number of, uh, number of uh, charges that are stored, so the, actually the memory density goes up. And this memory is actually has to be Actually, at least this has to be stored for about, yeah, you may, you may actually store some memory and which you may not use for next 10 years. So at least it should be on for next 10 years. So the, you have to see that the voltage actually should not decay with time. And see, this is that has been done. So I'll stop, I'll basically go to the, and now from the, well, one example I've taken, instead of nano CMOS, I've taken nano crystal memory. So the next half an hour or so, I'll concentrate more on the, nanophotonic devices. Why do we need photonic devices? See, one of the, as you see in my, this one again, this is a little bit old data. I've got from the mobile data traffic forecast from Cisco, as you see that this is the, the internet use is going up every day. And it is almost exponentially growing from 2000, last five years, 12 to 16. And I'm sure that as yeah, you can predict that it has gone up somewhere here. So this is actually, we are saying exabyte per month. Okay, exabyte is basically that, uh, yeah, is a, one exabyte is actually one billion gigabyte. As you know, gigabyte is your so-called your 10 to one nine byte, okay? And this is one billion. So 10 to 15 gigabyte is your one exabyte. And as you see that it uh, is going up. So that's good. Since it's going up, we are getting better and better devices. But the problem is that, is there any problem on internet growth? If I give a search in this figure, I have given a search on the, it's on SN both. And immediately I get probably millions of results within a, a 0.6 second. But as you know that every time you give an internet search, so it has to go to the search of the Google server, okay? Your computer takes some power. The data has to, information has goes to Google server and from Google server it has to come to your computer. So there is a cost of it. And this cost is actually the energy. So every energy used by a single Google search is equivalent to turning up a 60 watt light bulb for so every Google search you give it to get a uh, huge, huge, amount, huge amount of energy that 60 watt light bulb for 70 seconds. And now you count how many, how many millions of Google search or billion of Google search done by uh, throughout the world. And now you can think of if you calculate that how much energy actually consumed simply by the internet searching. And now what is the solution of that? In addition to the power that your silicon CMOS transistor actually do, we do a lot of power simply by internet searching, by uploading, downloading video files, our files, etc. The only thing is that actually by using instead of electronic circuit, probably using a something called a photonic circuit. So can you do all this kind of switching that I have shown that 0, 1 by optical switching and do some time kind of a optical integrated circuits. And this is coming up very, very fast. It is called like this silicon photonics, actually, that whether you can make photonic devices on silicon. Okay, there are some alternative other, uh, other technologies also. That one is also coming up with spin based devices called spintronics. One is, of course, the quantum devices by tunneling, etc. These are actually called the tunneling or ballistic transport devices. So many things can happen. Now, the question is that why photonic devices? What does the photonic devices do? What is the problem with electronic devices? Firstly, you know that photon does not carry a charge, isn't it? So when the photon switches on device from the off to on, there's no charge current. Electron has a charge, that's why there is charge current. So there's no charge current, okay? Speed of the photon is much faster than the electron. So much faster. So you high speed, okay? And low power, very, very low power. And the size of the photonic devices are normally much, much higher than the typically that electronic devices. So the fabrication becomes very, very easy. Okay. And of course, the other thing is, of course, the larger bandwidth. And as you know that uh, there are any electronic communications, electromagnetic interference, that if you have got two parallel lines and there's a voltage between that, you have got, you have got electromagnetic interference and which is not there in a photonic devices because there's no charge. So ideally, it will be huge advantage. So the people are trying for uh, last two, three decades, 
but the yeah so let me tell you yeah so yeah this is the kind of a scheme of a photonic devices the people are think of silicon photonics now the biggest problem of silicon photonics is as i said the bottlenecks the silicon is an indirect band gap semiconductor so it does not give a basically optical emissions okay so light very very low light emission efficiency in addition is a very low broadband optical so very bad quality optical material low electro uh, optic coefficient and high propagation losses so silicon is very good god blessings that silicon is a very good electronic material but very poor photonic material but the people have already demonstrated in the last few years as you see that from here i can show that the how the silicon photonics are actually the use of the silicon photonics are increasing day by day the technology i'll discuss with you it is something like a uh, silicon chip is like a silicon chip and then you have got electro optic modulator you have got filter you have got a optical fiber coupler from where the laser is coupled here of the these things and these are the laser as a light source so your all source detector modulator on the same chip like a like a normal cmos circuit now as you are seeing that uh, okay take the current example current two example so the how how nicely you could predict the cyclone that was hitting orissa and bengal about the two weeks back i was almost almost 99% actual on dot why it happened because there is a lot of data available for our uh, with for weather predictions and from there you can do computational modeling and give a nice predictions this is one example second example you know every day actually you know that you have to do the dna and rna sequencing whether that covid virus is corona virus having double mutant triple mutant when that changing the character so you can think of through all globally people are loading lot of lot of data in a public domain so all this data has to be actually processed handled and all this data processing takes lots of power so as you see that Uh, this is called a, a new field that actually has uh, now has come as, as you know a field called data science so that means it shows with the data science that we will be using lot of data in the future and this silicon photonics actually actually uh, plays a huge role to take lot of data as you see that this is a this is a silicon photonics for other application and the green one is a silicon photonics for data center so there is a prediction probably in the next generation or the next decade silicon photonics will be as important as the or as competitive or as popular as the silicon electronic market so that's why the people have started uh, working on this for the last 10 years now as i told you that okay silicon does not emit light so what is the solution the solution is that oh, you you do silicon cmos mass circuit or the silicon substrate and actually you create fabricate something called the waveguide on silicon and what you do on that actually in parallel you take a uh, direct band gap semiconductor like indium phosphide and and actually make lasers on this indium phosphide okay and then what you do there is a technology available in the uh, silicon and insulator technology or semiconductor industry that you make lasers out of that and glue this indium phosphide on the silicon substrate with waveguide so you do something like that you put it together glue it together and then what happens you have got silicon as a substrate all all the silicon cmos will be there and all the optical sources detectors will be in the phosphide and then you have got some kind of a silicon photonic circuit so people have already demonstrated a chip actually mean intel has demonstrated silicon photonic chip so whose density is not as good as the, the billions of transistors maybe about 100000 optical components per transistor but this is still very huge and this will go up in next generation but in quantum technology on or so called by using the quantum physics is it possible to get actually that light out of silicon if we can really get the laser out of silicon then things it, it will be as good as a normal silicon cmos because your pure laser is out of silicon its photodiode is out of silicon and cmos are out of silicon so that's what something is going on okay initially the people demonstrated in the pale lab that if you can really make porous silicon or a nanowires of silicon and you shine with the light ultraviolet light it emits some actually radiation so visible radiation so this is very very exciting and through that 
uh, for the last 20 30 years people are doing lot of work to make the silicon quantum wires quantum dots using silicon germanium using silicon germanium tin germanium tin to make a direct band gap emission still we don't have a full success but there are some partial success that you can have a quasi direct band gap on the silicon materials and to make these devices Okay, this is the probably once uh, one uh, these things probably it has been shown by somebody who was taking a quantum dot. This is the quantum size effect that quantum well. And as you as you see, if you reduce the size of the width of the well from higher width to medium width to lower width, the the, the actual energy changes. So wavelength decreases from red to green to blue. So probably just try to show somewhere. So. Uh, in fact, uh, I also one uh, one uh, one kind of a uh, this kind of a one kind of a silicon based optical devices as a source. But Devashish also Devashish Panda also worked a lot, Kostopdas etc. to give a light emission from a uh, so called the silicon. So what you did, did in this case we take a make a germanium nanocrystal because germanium is also a kind of a uh, uh, material of group four element. So put germanium nanocrystals, and if you see the TM here, we put germanium nanocrystals in a silicon dioxide matrix. And what happens actually, due to this quantum size effect, the germanium nanocrystals actually now almost behave like a direct band gap material. Because the difference of energy between the indirect band gap and direct band gap in germanium is very, very small. So if you put some kind of quantum size effect, that means put germanium nanocrystals or quantum dots embedded in a high band gap matrix, they almost behave like a uh, red band gap material. That's what we wanted to show and we published a lot of papers. So this was basically showing that number uh, density of the germanium nanocrystal and the size of the germanium nanocrystals, the average size is about 9 to 10 nanometer. Please remember this size has to be lower than the de Broglie wavelength labeling that I calculated or that I showed earlier. And since the germanium has low effective mass, germanium deep wavelength is about 20 nanometer or so. So if you make a 10 nanometer, they are actually quantum confined. So if you do that, actually, if you take different samples, you don't have to go detailed on that. What I want to show that uh, you see that uh, we get a optical emission intensity at different wavelengths is the blue, green, and red. When the size of the nanocrystal was very, very high, or there are some defects, this germanium nanocrystal shows an emission in the red region, which is very broad. When the nanocrystal size was reduced, it became green. And when it becomes further reduced, you get a light emission from germanium. And as you see that this emission takes place in the visible wavelength range, and this wavelength takes place at room temperature. This, this is one of the way to get the light made of germanium quantum dot. And many people are doing on that. So either people put some kind of strain on some kind of quantum confinement, and there's a and put some kind of alloying with the germanium with tin and try to get a light emission from this. So uh, some demonstration was there by the germanium lasers. And if these are successful, these are acceptable as a technology, and I believe this can be done. So this could be kind of a uh, kind of a technology for the future silicon photonic devices. Yeah, this actually, in this case, germanium nanocrystals were taken either in a silicon dioxide matrix or aluminum oxide matrix or hafnium oxide matrix. Only the band gap has to be high. And you get the light emissions at different wavelengths. This is just to show that this works not only for silicon dioxide, this works for different kinds of materials. And you see that nanocrystal size made from the TEM and measured from the TEM is about five to seven nanometers. And this also almost matches experimentally with the quantum confinement theory from that from which actually you have calculated the from the emission wavelength, we calculated the nanocrystal size. So this actually matches with the theory. So this is one technology which can come up for silicon photonics in the future. And probably I have not shown you how typically this is grown. So this is one of the very, very sophisticated technology, how this uh, germanium quantum dots can be grown on, uh, on, a, on a silicon or silicon dioxide. This is, a, uh, this is basically ultra high vacuum equipment. As you know, the base pressure of the system is about 5 into 10 to the minus 10 millibar. So if you think of atmospheric pressure is one bar, okay, and you are seeing that uh, that it yeah sorry yeah so thousand bar actually right yeah so and you are going you are going to millibar uh, that is a five ten to the minus ten uh, millibar so that means you are really going to 
very very uh, high vacuum we call ultra vacuum if you grow germanium on silicon what happens due to lattice mismatch of germanium and silicon as i showed you earlier they try to grow as the islands after some thickness and if you stop the growth at low temperature and after certain thickness you get this germanium nano crystal and germanium quantum dot so this is the purely beauty of the material science and this is necessary that if you grow a new materials then only you can actually use then use the nano fabrication technology to make those devices the other thing is that you can stop a uh, so till now i have given you some example of quantum oil actually uh, as well as the quantum dot as a nano crystal memory or the light coming out of the silicon due to the quantum dot now i'll just give you some example of uh, silicon nanowires and which are more compatible to silicon cmos circuit because as i said that this can be used as a channel of the phase but i will give you some example of them uh, kind of a devices mos devices using this silicon nanowire okay so this i have taken uh, slide up take in pampas jagdish who was my friend and australian national university that uh, and he and this is the nano i actually this is schematic of the nano wire he grows india phosphide and uh, gallium phosphate gallium arsenic nano wires for making lasers leds photo detectors biosensor solar cells and the advantage is that during the growth of the nano wire you can make a pn junction also you see this is a p and this is i i means intrinsic and you can dope it so you make a pn junction in the nano wire or you can make a one nanowire as the core and other nanowire as the cell so you can make a defined kind of nanowire you can make a bunch of nanowires so you, something like this this is a bunch of nanowires so you can make lot of circuitry so people have uh, thinking also that whether we can use the nanowire for electrical connections of this so called ultra large scale integrated circuits so this look very very uh, attractive have a high potential the nanowires can be grown by many different technique one of the techniques that we have used in our laboratory is a very cheap technique you can of course the uh, technique that kospa has shown probably i will show also one of the device using nanolithography but here actually using the something approach called the uh, not the top down approach called the bottom up approach you can simply chemically etch silicon nanowires silicon substrate using a, some kind of catalyst and hydrochloric acid and you can get this kind of nanowires This is as you see that the nanowire dimensions is below 100 nanometer or so, and from the top it looks like these arrays of nanowires. And if you can separate the nanowires, and if you can actually do some kind of an isotropic etching, you can have either nanowires or a nano cones like this. And then you can use some of these nanowires, nano cones, take them out and put in your silicon MOSFET and make a silicon nanowire MOSFET. okay in this case actually uh, what i want to show because i told you that there is a big problem in having a uh, lasing out of uh, light out of a uh, injured band gap material in this case what we have used is the silicon nano cone and the silicon nano cone we have deposited cadmium sulfide by technique called pulse laser deposition technique and cadmium sulfide as you know is a direct band gap material so you can have a pn junction with a either cadmium sulfide or gallium arsenide or anything in the phosphide with the silicon nanowires and since you have a pn junctions if you can bias them you can just get a kind of light light emission from this material and that's what i have shown here actually uh, this was actually by shubendu's work uh, that he has shown that if you put a uh, silicon uh, yeah sorry origins work actually if you take a silicon uh, uh, nanowire and on that you put cadmium sulfide and you put a kind of a different uh, you get a different kind of uh, light emission in this case this is the if the color red color you see this is due to silicon nano crystals cadmium sulfide is comes from the cadmium sulfide and what you get is a kind of a uh, kind of color which is little bit mix of this and this can be actually detectable by the bri so it was detected by a simply a photographic camera this is the one way to get the light out of a silicon structure when the silicon nanowire is the template and you take a 3 5 band uh, direct band gap material on that so that can be one way to make the leds or lasers out of uh, silicon kind of devices in this work uh, the kostov actually was also one of the kostov uh, thesis work he was there and professor rai choudhury we, we actually uh, collaborated with him with asin post center at that time he was the director of the asin post center so i just showed that i have taken one of the nanowire and i put the nanowire in a simple silicon dioxide coated silicon substrate 
and I can make a source contact and drain contact. In fact, in this case, I am not quoting source and drain. I am quoting as the actually lateral contact. These are two sideway contacts actually. So back to back kind of a uh, this uh, gold is actually short key barrier. So gap back to back short key barrier diode. So this is one to metal to semiconductor, metal to semiconductor. This is called metal semiconductor metal diode. And we take a simple silicon nanowire as a, and we try to see that what is the actually the efficiency of the photo detection. Because as you know, the semiconductor works as a not only light detection, a light emitter, it works as a photovoltaic devices as well as a silicon detector. And for uh, silicon photonic circuits, you need everything like emission as well as the detection. So in this case, we wanted to make a very, very high efficiency uh, MSM photo detector using silicon nanowire. And what I put, uh, if I put the actually this uh, silicon nanowire detector and scan them from a wavelength range of 400 nanometer to 1000 nanometer, as you see that we get something called that. See, for the photo detector, the figure of merit is the responsivity that how much ampere per watt. That means if you put a one watt of photon, how much of current you are able to generate. So if the because as you know, the photon has got a very, very low power because normally that you, you detect signals of very low power. So this power can be in the range of pico watt or nano watt, and you should have a sufficient current generated. So the responsibility should be as high as possible. If we see for two devices, actually we have to use the one device of 80 nanometer diameter and one of 100 nanometer diameter. So as you see, this is of 100 nanometer diameter. So if you can see that with the responsibility is a peak around around 900 nanometer or so. So this is the near bandage of the silicon. So at the band gap of the silicon, it is highest. So near infrared, that is what is expected. And what is the value of the responsibility? About almost one into 10 to 4 ampere per watt. Now, if you buy a commercial photo detector for the market, silicon p injection photo detector, this value is about 0.5 ampere per watt. And you are getting about 10,000 ampere per watt. So you can think of that the enhancement that you are getting simply this is a now is a quantum wire and nano wire and not the bulk material. If you reduce the size of the nano wire diameter, actually you see now it's a now instead of uh, this thing, this is a 25,000 ampere per watt. So it's a huge, huge responsibility. And these are actually very important because a new technology is coming on very, very fast. It's called quantum photonics. The question is that whether we can do detect a single photon because single photon will have a power of less than one picowatt or maybe femtowatt. If you can really detect single photon, we can do some kind of a quantum information or quantum communication using single photonic uh, detection. So these quantum dots or these nanowires can be used as a single photon detector, but we could not uh, go up to single photon. Ideally, if you can go to 10 to a 6 ampere per watt, you can probably a single photon. So this is the responsibility, of course, of two devices. This is the responsibility at different gate biases. And you can show that really you can get a very, very high uh, responsibility. Okay, in this case, I have shown that uh, not only as a diode, we can use as a photo transistor. And this is exactly will be the actually for a silicon nanowire transistor. And you see that this is like a MOSFET. We have got a source, we have got drain, the silicon nanowire is the channel. Then we have got silicon as a substrate, and we have got silicon dioxide as the gate dielectric. In this case, actually, we have made a backgated fate because we want to sign the optical radiation from the top. So we don't want to see anything on the top. So the light falls in silicon nanowire because we wanted to use as a photo transistor instead of a normal transistor. But ideally, the same, same device can be used by photo transistor. And this particular device was actually made by a technique called electron beam lithography, which Kostov is discussing. And you see the dimension of the nanowire, the 15, 500 nanometer, 200 nanometer, and goes up to 50 nanometer, or even you can go below. So what we have started, we have started with the silicon and insulator wafer, and start and actually by using nanolithography, you can make either single wire or you can make the arrays of nanowire, either as a detector or transistor. And you see very nice transistor technology. As you know, that is a, always a MOSFET, the characteristics, if you remember, this will be typically off. And then if you put a bias, actually, this will go on and show a characteristic, fake characteristic like this. In this case, the photo transistor, that's why 
when it is dark, the photoconjunction is off. As we are putting a small amount of light, you see nanowatt of light, 2.5 nanometer, 5 nanometer, the, the drain current of this goes up. So this is a phototransistor. And then we're trying it, of course, a defined wavelength and trying to see that, uh, how does it work? So the, this is a kind of a proof of concept. The nanowire can be used as a phototransistor and as well as a normal transistor. So yeah, so this is, again, I think I will not uh, go to this because it's the same example in this instead of silicon nanowire, we have taken a germanium nanowire. And we have also seen that if you take a germanium nanowire, you can again easily get a, a 5 kiloampere watt, that is 5,000 ampere per watt. This is on the visible region, because in this case, most of the response was coming from germanium oxide. So this is one thing that the last work that we have done on a using a germanium nanowire, actually that uh, again a single nanowire, so that as I told you that uh, germanium is very, very important in the fiber optical communication wavelength. Uh, the optical communication of length is 1500 nanometer or so. So if I take a germanium on silicon, we get a emission, the good, very, very good responsivity actually in the firstly in the uh, silicon wavelength range. And this is the germanium wavelength range. And as you see, you get very res good responsivity. So this is called a kind of two channel detector, one channel in the near infrared range and one channel in the fiber optic wavelength range. And you can really detect a very, very low kind of a optical power with this. So Devashish, I am, am I done or I can continue for five minutes? What is the plan? So you can take, sir, you can take, sir. As per my time, this is done. But okay, uh, probably since you started a little bit late, so can I uh, take five to seven minutes? Yes, sir, you can take, sir. You can take, sir. But of course, I will be very happy to keep some time for some questions from the students. So that is the most important. Uh, so you can take whatever you like, sir. No, I may be five, seven minutes. There's no point okay. of taking more time and there's no answer. Okay, sir. Like okay. So uh, that actually, the uh, right now I'm talking about the research work, uh, mostly that I uh, say the silicon nanowire or silicon quantum dots, etc. Now, as you know, there are a lot of, uh, lot of uh, excitement with uh, one more material called graphene kind of material, which is called two-dimensional material. These are also nanomaterial. That if you put, take a graphite substrate and take a flex out of that, it is basically nothing but graphene. So the question is that, and graphene can be easily transferred onto silicon dioxide or silicon substrate. So the question was that, can we use a 2D material and transfer on a 3D substrate? And can you make a photonic devices? You don't have to grow by MBE technique. So it's very, very easy to do. And here you don't bother about the lattice mismatch because the 2D thickness of this 2D material is only a few nanometer. A thickness of a graphene layer or a two-dimensional material that I will take care is only a few nanometer. So that was the question, but graphene is not very good because graphene is not a semiconductor. Graphene is also called actually almost a zero band gap material or a semi-metal. So that's why graphene does not have much interaction with the light. So graphene is not very physically, I mean, photoactive. So one more material has actually has come. So probably it's called actually, uh, probably I'm missing one slide. There's something called transition metal dichalcogenide, like a, Transition metals is basically molybdenum, okay? And dichalcogenide means uh, sulfur, selenium, tellurium. So you can make a material called two-dimensional TMDC, like molybdenum sulfide, molybdenum selenide, molybdenum tellurite, et cetera, it can be in huge combinations. And why it is important? Because these materials are actually BS like a semiconductor, particularly when they're monolayer thick. So if you make a monolayer of this molybdenum sulfide, Molybdenum sulfide bulk is not a actually is a, is a semiconductor, but the indirect band gap semiconductor. As soon as you make a monolayer, it becomes a direct band gap semiconductor. So this is again actually the quantum effect. So all this quantum effect is very important when the size is very small. So that is a great example. So if I can simply make um, a layers of molybdenum sulfide nanocrystals on a silicon substrate, and in this case, my uh, student Shubrojit has shown that I immediately can make a broadband light source. And you see that he has applied a light source, he has applied a bias. So these are molybdenum sulfide nanocrystals pin coated on a silicon uh, substrate. And you put a gold electrode on the top and this thing, and if you bias it, you inject some of the electrons in molybdenum sulfide nanocrystals, and you give a kind of a radiative recon recombination. And the light intensity is quite high. You see, this can be seen in the, uh, I mean, white light emission in the actually, in the BRI. 
Why this is white light? Because this is done by chemical method. So the size of the nanocrystal is not controlled. So that's why it's giving white light. So, so that shows that these kind of things are coming very fast in your... Uh, so, but if you have a better control instead of nanocrystals or instead of a different size, in this case, the example of a uh, roof's work on you have got a, uh, the tungsten sulfide seeds, and uh, sometimes the seeds are bilayer, sometimes they're monolayer, sometimes they're few layer. And if you are lucky that if you can put some of these seeds actually, w, in this case, WS2 seeds were actually put on silicon substrate and the WS2 is typically p time and silicon substrate is n type and you can make a PN junction. And as you see that it is almost like a, its behavior is rectified, it's being like a, this, is a, this is a reverse uh, bias, the forward bias, so it was like a diode. If you sign the light with that and you see that it works a photo detector, and I see that if you take a capacitors or voltage characteristics, it's almost like an abrupt PM junction diode. Of course, uh, in this case, we get the ideality factor is about two, but normally that ideal diode, uh, homo junction diode is, should be one. And as you can see that this diode also can be used as a, can rectify in a, in a sine wave or AC signal. So this was the input signal of 100 hertz. We put in, uh, connect to the diode and output we get like this. So it's a good rectifier, the good PN junction. So this gives us some kind of uh, hope that we can really make a uh, good uh, optical devices made of uh, 2D materials uh, on silicon devices. I will just skip these slides uh, because this will some, take some time. I just wanted to probably show this uh, kind of thing. So what we did in this case, and you know that uh, this doping of these 2D materials are not easy because the thickness is so small. So what we can, we can do, you can put some metal nanoparticles in the material. In fact, that's what I was trying to show in the probably in this first schematic actually. So come back here. So we basically uh, put a silver particles in this WS2 nano seeds that I have shown earlier. And this silver nanoparticles are actually put a, put a little bit of cell of uh, a polymer, PV polymer. Then the electrons from this silver nanoparticle can actually cross this, hop this, and contribute a lot of electrons in WS2. And earlier it was WS2 was P type, now the WS2 becomes N type. And not only that, these metal nanoparticles also actually confine the light on the surface, a phenomena called actually strong light absorptions called a plasmonics. So by doing those, you can make, uh, probably that will be my, my last slide, we make uh, defined kind of devices. In this case, the first devices that we have shown earlier, actually, that P silicon substrate, uh, sorry, yeah, N silicon substrate we have taken, and WS2 is a P type typically. So we make a PN junctions, and you make a photo detector. And as you see that, uh, you get a current voltage access to like this. On the other hand, when you put a silver nanoparticles doped uh, WS2, we call NAJPW, and we make a junction of P-silicon substrate, can also it works like a diode. Only the bias is different because, the, as you know, the uh, silicon has changed from N-type to P-type. And if we just measure their actually the responsibility, that's the figure of uh, merit that I was talking about. In a typical 2D on silicon, as you see that this one, this one is a conventional device, the red one, the PWS to an N-silicon. So here you see two peaks here. One peak is due to that WS2 absorption peak. One is the silicon absorption peak. But you see that his responsibility is only about 0 0.2, 0 0.25 amp ampere per watt. The, because the thickness of the 2D material is very, very small, so the overall, overall absorption of the light is very small. On the other hand, when you put silver nanoparticles, because of the plasmonic effect, a strong light absorption effect, they actually that it goes by increases the five times, and as you see that that it becomes about one ampere per watt. So of course there is a change of wavelength also because that is the uh, dielectric effect or the plasmonic effect due to silver nanoparticles, and so we can easily get about by using a ten volt or so you can easily use a, about eight ampere per watt in this case. Again I say please check the number, check the number of a commercial PN junction photo projector is about 0.5 ampere per watt. So using this 2D materials on silicon, you can get a much, much higher responsibility. And these 2D materials can be simply uh, mechanically exfoliated and put on the silicon wafer, or maybe by CVD technique can be grown. 
so i think i have uh, finished i will not go anywhere else so basically this is my concluding slide actually i was telling you that intel has already demonstrated this is an old slide this is a hybrid cmos circuit where actually that you have got on silicon that you have got these are actually that uh, so called the typical microprocessor chip okay at part of the silicon you use for the making the microprocessor and from there actually you see that this dot gives like this this dot give like this so you make your optical components like optical components receiver transceiver transmitter photo detector wave guide etc these are actually optical components so in this chip you see that this part is optical components this part is optical components and if you put lot of optical components basically this is a silicon cmos chip but still these optical components are made of not of made of silicon is a made of gallium arsenide in the phosphor it's like this so the population density is very very low as soon as you put a silicon uh, so called the silicon quantum dots or nanomaterial there will be completely silicon uh, photonic circuits then the you can say silicon photonics based microprocessor that has been demonstrated by intel so that's all here we will end so we have a very high hope that silicon nano electronics will go down to again to 1 to 2 nanometer as ibm and tsmc has said on the other end lot of quantum effects will come into picture and lot of growth in silicon photonics and probably all these things will lead to some kind of a uh, in future probably you will see that really a quantum computer ultimately is working uh, or a photonic integrated circuit available commercially in a market with this i thank you and i'll be very happy to take up some questions thank you thank you sir for your nice talk uh, uh, session is open for the participants they can uh, ask sir directly any question you can unmute yourself and you can talk to sir uh, sir good afternoon good afternoon Uh, sir, I am Narayan Sahu from Barampur University. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, uh, just I have a query. Uh, we know normally the direct band gap uh, material are very uh, frequently used for uh, photonic devices uh, mm -hmm. due to transition. So uh, the silicon uh, in the field of photonics. So, uh, sir, uh, actually, how uh, this indirect band gap? Silicon is indirect band gap. So, which uh, means uh, how uh, this uh, property of silicon we use for this photonics? Yes. So, yeah, that's what you are right. That uh, all, all, all lasers uh, and like uh, LEDs that you get in the market is uh, basically made of direct band gap material because silicon the light emission efficiency is very, very small. Okay, very, very low. Yeah. You yeah. don't get. It. so that's why uh, that's why that uh, we are thinking that whether it is possible to change the band gap of this material so what you have to do you have to change the band gap of the material okay so the band gap of the material can be changed by many ways if you put lot of strain in the material the band gap can, the actual band structure will change okay so silicon band structure what you calculate is basically at a room temperature at surface pressure now if you can put lot of pressure okay that band gap actually may go from the uh, so called direct band gap to quasi direct band and uh, indirect band gap to quasi direct band gap and that's what i told you that silicon is still not a very good material to get the laser but germanium is better now germanium is you know is very much compatible to silicon as a semiconductor now the difference between the band gap of germanium the indirect band gap of germanium to direct band gap of germanium is very very small is about point One seven electron volt or so. Okay, in the case of silicon, it is very high. It is about one point five electron volt. So if you put germanium thin film or a quantum dot or a nano wire, and the strain can be built. You apply. You cannot apply any pressure, of course, and the device. So the so strain has to be inbuilt developed. The strain will be developed either by putting a silicon nitrate layer or by a self assembled germanium. Okay. Or or you do some quantum confinement. What happens? What is quantum confinement? That means when the when the size of this material becomes less than the de Broglie level of the excited board areas, you get in the you get a defined kind of material. It's not a bulk material. Okay. Then if you do this band structure calculation of the bulk this quantum material, they almost behave like a quasi detect. So these are the defined ways. One more way is as I told you that if you put tin is a direct band gap material. the alpha tin is a semiconductor 
and comes in the same uh, group of the silicon germanium carbon alpha tin okay if you put put a mono tin 8 to 10% of tin since the tin is joint bonding material germanium tin becomes a joint bonding material so these are some of the ways there is no complete success till now but uh, i hope that this will give rise to some kind of a uh, light sources for future silicon super but actually it may not be based on silicon it may be based on germanium tin germanium or silicon germanium etc like that okay uh, uh, professor uh, my uh, my question would be of a little uh, different kind as farooq mistri says uh, atman nirbhar bharat you know you have just showed us by the moore's law that uh, the rate at which we are going into 2 nanometer and 1 nanometer Right. as a country where does india stand if it decides to go into manufacturing or mm. are we already late and we should not even think about it and we should go only to design 4.0 and leave industry 4.0 so no, this is a, this is a very good question actually a very good question for the so even for the students they should know see of course we have uh, missed the bus so this is no doubt about it and uh, both of the foundries are not now in usa most of the foundries are in uh, china korea singapore malaysia etc you know that korea so that way the making a fab is actually extremely difficult and as you saw that by the time you now plan a fab of suppose 8 nanometer by the time you complete the fab in going to 2 nanometer 1 nanometer so it will be out of the market so this one dilemma has actually and of course it depends on the government policy probably india should have actually invested in 80s and 90s it didn't happen actually so it is too late to make a silicon fab and compete with uh, these people so the other way is that uh, that whether we can really make the no that's why i came to silicon photonics now silicon photonics is one of the way because the photonic components the size of these components are in the uh, microns of uh, length actually that's why the density is small and since the silicon photonics is coming in a big way and making these things are really easy in india so india is really thinking of some photonics hub or maybe photonics fab and if you some of you know that a uh, few months back that government of india that that have a very big vaibhav summit across all these uh, this thing from people uh, indians staying abroad and the silicon photonics is one of the way because there is a big big investment in quantum photonics and quantum computing so so it is probably too late to make the uh, silicon so called the uh, cmos fab so in that case if you make the uh, so called the silicon photonic devices it is possible that we can go to more on quantum photonics or quantum computing that is in the future so that is true uh, india could not really took a decision at the right time and so this is almost like you missing the bus the other is the problem is that you have to invest like china china has now uh, china has uh, come to the market much la- uh, later than the taiwan korea singapore isn't it uh, for the last 10 years or so but they are already in the market and they have taken this as the highest priority this is they call the oil of the future the actual oil of the future is not really the crude oil the silicon devices are the actually oil of the future but i think they have uh, using a kind of a trillion dollar of investment to make not you have to really make a fab don't make one fab you have to make it ten fabs then only you can survive yeah i might uh, just some small subset at iit kharagpur what kind of uh, products can we design in uh, what uh, uh, technology we can design at iit kharagpur or any other top place in india because the last time we had designed uh, uh, ic we had to uh, send it across to europe to fabricate it uh, under the university mm-hmm. program mm-hmm. so suppose any of our professors mm-hmm. and teachers do design a uh, thing what are the kind of fa- fabrication facilities available for the public in india okay yeah that's a very good question yes the design yeah, i for, i mean, i forgot to answer that part of the question that's why india is contributing a lot in the vlsi design because most of the iits uh, think they have got vlsi design center so not, not only iit kharagpur many other iits so which is of course far away from the fabrication very recently iit madras has really made the first chip which is designed in india and fabricated in excel chandigarh 
see you have to also remember that uh, one thing that iit madras want to show they have made a really a very kind of a cheap and ultimate for all applications we don't need actually nano application control circuits of uh, many things for the size of the transistors can be even few microns two microns three microns just like that so that way that uh, that way the design i don't think that iits are probably the the, the main problem in this design is that you make a design but unless you uh, fabricate and get it tested the design is useless that's what happens sometimes that they do a lot of designs but finally you want to send for fabrication for tsmc and other things sometimes it is uh, late in getting the results but uh, probably i am not really very much updated probably iit real sci real center probably right now can design and uh, not even 14 nanometer probably probably sub 35 nanometer or so but uh, i have to check that part so not really in the nano electronic levels as such not of state of the art but i have to update myself so that's why uh, still india can be definitely atmanirbhar in terms of uh, uh, silicon design and chip design real side design but of course uh, uh, most of the customers will be from outside so you may not be able to fabricate your own chip you know not be fully atmanirbhar in that case so uh, with that i like to request our one of the participants uh, professor naran sahu from belampur university to give the vote of thanks for the to रिगार्डिंग स्टार्टिंग फ्रम दि बेसिक क्वांटम डिस् फिजिक्स and uh, the low uh, low dimensional heterostructure like uh, quantum well quantum wire quantum dot and uh, their applications uh, in different domain so uh, today i feel what is popular lecture we have actually i have attended a lot of lecture lot of talk but th that's why this is called a popular talk so thank you very much sir for this uh, talk and enlightening all of us regarding silicon photonics and also encourage us to start some research on this silicon photonics thank you thank you very much sir sure, sure thank you so much yeah i wanted to make little bit popular because i thought a um, lot of lectures have been taken so the, now the particular the participants are little bit aware of the technology etc so that's why i wanted to make little bit popular one to give them a kind of overview